Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Bioinformatics, Computational Biology, and Neuroscience track. This will be our final talk of the session. Up next, we'll be hearing about Cell by Gene Discover Census, brought to us by Pablo Garcia Nieto. Hi, everyone. My name is Pablo Garcia. I'm a computational biologist at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, or CCI for short. And I first want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present at SciPy. This is my first time in this conference, and it's been an amazing experience so far. Uh, it's great to hear the latest developments in the Python ecosystem and how these are being applied in different um, scientific disciplines. And so with that, I want to give you a high-level overview of a recently released feature, census of uh, one of our products, Cell by Gene Discover. So at CCI, the science initiative, we have a 10-year mission of supporting our understanding of the mysteries of the cell through me measuring human biology. And because of that, we have a single cell team at CCI. And in the team, we aim to further our understanding of the human body and diverse diseases of the body through the fundamental unit of life, the cell. Our approach is to accelerate single cell biology methods, technologies, and applications. And we do this by two different means. On the one hand, we provide funding for single cell research. And on the other hand, we develop uh, technological solutions that help in the processing and analysis of the data produced by the single cell community. But why single cell? Um, truly single cell captures uh, the biology of an organism at a very high resolution. And with the technologies that are available to us now to interrogate single cells, uh, we can do this at very large scales. This is very important to give you some context. Uh, humans have in the order of tens of trillions of cells, and the genome encodes more than 60,000 genes. So with single cell technologies and the most common one being single cell RNA sequencing, uh, we can interrogate the expression of every single gene in individual cells for a given sample. So give, this gives us high resolution for the gene expression profile of all, the, all, of all the cells that we're measuring. With this gene expression profiles, we can uh, decode and understand cell function, disease, the intercellular context, as well as the genotype of the donor who gave the sample. So you can imagine that the more data that we have in this space, the more equipped we are to start interrogating uh, the human body at a systematic level. And because of this, over the last 15 years, there has been an explosion of studies in the field that are, are mainly intended to produce uh, single cell data. And there has been a huge international effort and different consortia that support the generation of this data. Um, so uh, over the last few years, uh, the number of studies that get published per year, it's in the order of hundreds. And each of these different studies, they produce very valuable uh, insights into the specific context in which they're generating single cell data. But now we have the opportunity to gather all of this data and to try to make sense of all of them together. So to give you an example of uh, the type of applications that we could do with the aggregation of data, uh, recently, Christina Theodoris and others published uh, GeneFormer. So GeneFormer is a context-aware, attention-based, deep learning model that's trained on 30 million cells. Now, these guys had to do the monumental effort to go and gather individual data, uh, reformatted, uh, harmonize the metadata and standardize everything so that they could put it into the model that they designed. So it's a huge effort before you can get into the data analysis. But once you have these type of models, uh, I really like one example task that they provided that you can do with the models. Uh, so given a set of a small sample of the C cells that I have, I can go and interrogate my model and ask the model, what are the top genes that I need to modify to tweak their expression to go from a disease state into a healthy state. Um, they, uh, they actually did a, a pre-train on, on this model to answer this specific question in the context of cardiac disease. 
and they were able to identify candidate genes that could go from the disease state into a healthy state, and they provided uh, experimental validation of their results, and they look pretty good. Uh, this is all in an in vitro system, so it's uh, exciting to see where this is going to take us in the clinic. So at TCI, uh, the tech team, we are mainly focused on two areas. Number one, we want to increase accessibility to single cell data, uh, to experimental biologists, and not only to single cell biologists, but the entire biology community. Uh, currently, the single cell field, it's relatively niche in terms of accessing the data, and so we want to expand access to the entire community. And to do that, we need to produce reusable data and processes, as well as user-friendly interfaces so that everybody can come and uh, gain insights from this data. And on the other hand, we want to foster computationally based applications like the one I just mentioned and discoveries of cell biology. Uh, to do this, we need to provide efficient access to harmonized data and provide analytical and modeling tools that work at the scale of millions of points. Well, in this case, we have an expression matrix that's millions of cells by thousands of genes. You go into the billions of number of points. So we truly need to have uh, efficient access and, and analytical pipelines that work at scale. To do that, we developed Cell by Gene Discover. Selva Gene Discover is a platform for browsing and analyzing standardized single cell data sets, and the standardized is a very important part that I'm gonna get into it in a second. Uh, and with this platform, you can explore gene expression uh, or download extensive uh, data sets. You can uh, go and explore the website at cellbygene.ccisience.com. Currently, we have uh, more than 45 million uh, uh, cells, and we have measured their ex or we have the measurements of the gene expression across the 60,000 genes for all of these cells, uh, and this comes from more than uh, 800 different data sets. So these data sets have been generated uh, by the entire community. Some of uh, these research studies have been funded by CCI, but uh, a lot of them have also uh, been funded elsewhere. Uh, you can see that the rate of ingestion of data into cell by gene is linear and constant, and we don't see our velocity of ingesting data stopping anytime soon, uh, particularly not in the next year. So we expect to uh, grow significantly uh, our corpus of data in the coming year. Now, coming back to the standardized aspect of our data, we work uh, with an amazing group of curators uh, their team is called Lattice. They are at Stanford, and uh, they uh, make sure that all the data that we ingest at Cell by Gene has gone through a standardization process. So that means that all of the gene expression matrices that we have in-house have row counts. I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but that's the uh, lowest level of representation that we can have of the, of the gene expression. Uh, frequently, researchers tend to do a lot of transformations on the data, and uh, for most other, uh, analytical processes, we require the, the, the cell counts, so or, or the actual row counts, and, and that's why we, we always have them in cell by gene. Along that, we standardize uh, both our feature metadata, uh, which relates to genes, as well as our cell metadata. So uh, we promise you that the gene IDs and the gene names are harmonized so that they are consistent across all of the data that we handle, and the same goes for the cell metadata. And in particular for cell metadata, we use ontologies, uh, which uh, let us leverage relationships between different values within a given variable. So for example, for cell types, we can understand how a given cell type is related to other cell types using an ontology. And again, we promise you that we'll always use a pin version of an ontology for all of the cell metadata that we have. Um, with Selva Gene, we provide visual tools that you can access online. Um, so you can analyze individual data sets in an interactive fashion. We have this scatter plot uh, visualization tool that lets you, uh, each point is represented uh, by a single cell, and then you can go and, and, and perform a lightweight analysis on individual data sets. We also have uh, newer features that we're planning to do, and the first demonstration of that in terms of integrating all of the data that we have in our corpus is uh, a, a tool called Gene Expression. With this tool, over here with this tool, what you can do is query the expression of any gene 
across all the cell types of a given tissue, and this, this uh, aggregates all of the data for a given tissue. And finally, we have uh, uh, interactive ways that you can browse and download individual data sets in the most common uh, Python and R formats that are used in the single cell community. But today I wanna tell you about Census. Uh, this is a newly developed and recently released uh, feature of Cell by Gene Discover. Um, so what is Census? It is built more for more than 500 different data sets and it's both a data object and an API to access this data object. So the process that we do to build the census, we have the individual data sets that have been ingested into cell by gene as individual units in a um, commonly used uh, Python encoding to access uh, this data, it's called AND data, and it uses HDA5 on the back end. So we have these individual data sets that come in different uh, forms and shapes, so different number of cells, different number of genes. They're all standardized. So what we do is we concatenate all of these expression matri ma matrices into a large concatenated object along with the cell and the gene metadata. So currently we have over 33 million cells in census. Um, now with the API, we can uh, lazily query and slice uh, this large concatenated object in any way you want. So uh, you can use coordinates to uh, create a, a slice of the, of the census but more importantly, you can use the cell and then the gene metadata to select a specific type of cells and specific genes that you're interested in. Uh, once you have performed your, uh, your query, then you can start streaming the data and export it into the R and Python APIs that we have. Uh, we use Apache Arrow as our intermediate in memory representation of the data, and because of that, we can very quickly jump into many other uh, data structures, both in Python and in R. Uh, just a quick note about the nature of the data. So currently, in the census, we include data from cell by gene discover that comes from either human or mouse, uh, RNA data. Uh, there's other single cell modalities that uh, do not measure RNA, but measure other molecules. We currently don't support those at the moment in the census, uh, but we're looking into exploring those areas. All the raw counts, as well as the cell and gene metadata that we have standardized. Uh, small notes, we also include two different, slightly different flavors of uh, uh, RNA sequencing, full gene sequencing read counts and molecule counts. This is important to keep in mind when you are interconnecting the two because they have uh, slightly different numerical properties. And finally, there's some level of duplication in the, in the number of cells that we have in census, but we provide you with a cell metadata variable for you to be able to filter in and out these duplicate cells. All right, so going to the API and how we made this happen. Um, TileDB collaborated very closely with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative uh, to develop TileDB Soma. So on the one hand, we have Soma, and Soma is an abstract API specification uh, that provides uh, you know, the standard way of defining uh, many different processes of the API as well as data objects. And it was mainly developed with having in mind the single cell data use case. And you, some of you may be familiar with TileDB and specifically with TileDB Embedded. This is a cloud native multimodal storage engine. And it's architected around uh, multi dimensional arrays. It provides uh, a, a very efficient access, uh, specifically from the cloud, uh, into uh, dense sparse arrays as well as data frames. Uh, so together, we implemented uh, the SOMA specification using TileDB Embedded, and thus we created TileDB SOMA. Uh, concretely, TileDB SOMA is a C++ library with Python and R APIs, and this is some of the advantages that we get out of, uh, out of this implementation. It's cloud-based. We can perform efficient uh, uh, queries for larger than memory data, so we can stream the data in chunks. Um, and we can query and access the data using uh, the cell or gene metadata. And I will show uh, some examples of that in a second. Uh, we also added uh, interoperability functionality to, uh, to TileDB Soma to very quickly export the data uh, into the more commonly used single cell toolkits in both Python and R. So for Python, we have AND data interoperability, and with R, we have Surat as well as Bioconductor interoperability. 
And because we're using Apache Arrow as the uh, in-memory representation of the data, uh, we can very quickly move uh, to different, uh, both Python and R uh, native data structures. So um, this is kind of an eagle view of how the uh, object looks online. We host it on Amazon S3, and we provide the storage and the bandwidth usage, so it's free to use and free to access. Um, gonna, go, gonna go very quickly on how the data uh, looks. So in TileDB somehow we have four main different data structures. We have collections, uh, sparse and dense arrays, as well as data frames. And any given census object is organized in, in, as a collection with two big items, uh, the census info and the census data. Census info contains uh, essentially um, high level metadata of the full census and then census data contain, contains the actual single cell uh, gene expression data. Within the census data, we have uh, a specialized form of a collection that's called experiment. And this is a very important type of collection and I'll show you some of the capabilities of it. And within an experiment, you'll always see an expression matrix that we call X. And this is the cell by gene uh, count matrix, as well as what we call axis data frames. This is the cell and the gene metadata. So the cell metadata we call ops uh, data frame, and then the gene metadata we call the var data frame. Uh, we have uh, plans to uh, publish this data uh, in a long-term supported uh, form of releases every six months, and we promise to make them available for up to five years from publication. And then just to keep up with the speed of ingestion, uh, we also plan to perform weekly releases uh, that we'll probably keep around for uh, up to a month. Um, so this is just a quick demo of how the API looks like in Python. So in this case, we are importing the API that uh, we have a dependency on TileDB Soma, so TileDB Soma is running on the background. And we can open the handle to the uh, uh, cloud stored uh, data. And once we have this handle here at census, then we can very Pythonically access uh, the different aspects of, of, or the different data structures that I just talked about. So in this case, I'm showing you an example of how to go into the census data, the homo sapiens experiments, and the ops uh, uh, cell metadata data frame. We can read this data frame and specify uh, value filters, uh, so essentially what cells you wanna get out of this data frame. So in this case, I am getting all of the female cells that are of cell type microglial cell or neuron, and I'm specifying the columns that I wanna get out of that data frame. Uh, this is going to uh, provide you with an iterator of pi arrow tables, and you can very quickly concatenate the results of the iterator to obtain a pi arrow table that you can convert to a pandas data frame, and the entire process of this uh, takes around 30 seconds, and with 30 seconds you get all the cell metadata for 300,000 cells. Uh, similarly, I have an example of how to import data into the AND data. This is the, the commonly used single cell toolkit in Python for single cell analysis. Uh, it works very similar as in uh, accessing the ops data frame. So in this case, we also have access to selecting specific genes. So here I'm selecting two genes, the same cells, uh, and then the specific columns for, from the ops data frame. And then I can, uh, in less than a minute, produce this AND data object that I can use for downstream analysis. Um, I wanna spend a little bit of time explaining how the experiment, an experiment axis query works, so this is the way that you can get access to pretty much all of the information within an experiment, so the X matrix as well as the axis data frames, but by uh, querying the axis data frames. So in this case, I am selecting a specific type of cells via an, an experiment axis query, and then I obtain a query result that let, lets me have access to uh, all of the different data structures within the census, and each of them I can have an iterator uh, to perform data streaming on them. So in this case, I'm showing uh, how to obtain an iterator out of the X matrix for the specific query that I just uh, obtained. And then I can just perform small uh, increments on the iterator to perform any sort of analysis that I want. Uh, lastly, I just wanna do a very quick dive on PyTorch loaders that we developed so that they can work natively on TileDB Soma and you can interact with the census with them right now. Um, so initializing uh, an experiment data pipe, which is a subclass of the PyTorch data pipe, is very easy. Uh, it's essentially the same interface as what I just showed you with the experiment axis query. Uh, you can select specifically the slice 
of the census that you want to work on. So in this case, I'm selecting all the cells from the tongue and that are unique. <laughs> and I'm getting as the uh, ops metadata, the cell metadata, the cell type. So this is usually what you're going to be using for predictions in, in, in the case that you're uh, creating predictive models. And then you're going to get the uh, expression uh, numerical values to utilize as, uh, as, as the values that you can use for the prediction. So once you create an experiment data pipe, since this is a PyTorch data pipe, um, this is very, um, you, you get access to all of the uh, PyTorch functionality, so you can uh, create random splits for uh, dividing your data into different data sets, um, and then you can shuffle the data, and therefore you can also initialize PyTorch loaders. Very quickly, this is what the tensors look like. So in this case, we have a batch size of 16, so you're gonna get a, a next tensor that has uh, the gene expression for 16 different cells across all of the genes that you selected, and then you're gonna have an ops tensor that has for every single cell an ID, as well as uh, the encoding for the cell metadata that you were focusing on, in this case, the cell type. Um, we put a lot of effort into uh, making it work out of the box, and you don't have to really worry about how the data is being fetched and you know the batch sizes in which we read the data from the internet and then the batch sizes in which we put them into the PyTorch loader. And so we uh, try to make our best to make this seamlessly and also very efficient. Uh, coming soon to the census, we're gonna have for, for a roadmap of the next of the year, more data releases. We want to increase efficiency to the data, so we're going to provide, provide data mirrors across, across the gloves to increase uh, your uh, data access speeds if, depending on, on what part of the world you are. Uh, we want to provide further support for data caching and make sure that the GPU uh, is fully supported in our PyTorch loaders. We want to add more data into the census, so a normalized layers on pre-calculated statistics as well as integrated embeddings that are very useful for computational biologists and provide more proof of principle uh, demonstrations of how to perform out of score calculations at scale. Uh, finally, I just wanna thank uh, the entire single cell CCI team, and in particular, uh, the core census team uh, highlighted here, Bruce, Emmanuel, Andrew, Mike, uh, as well as Stephanie. Uh, we're always here to help and always open to hear collaboration ideas. Feel free to email us or, and join the Slack channel. And very quick, I'm gonna do a quick plug to an RFA that's coming uh, later this year where we uh, are gonna op open, uh, open up funding for uh, uh, analysis of uh, already existing data. So stay tuned and feel free to check out our website for more information on this. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, we already have a question over here. I wanna remind people who are attending virtually that we do have a Slack channel uh, that has a thread where you can drop questions and we will read them out to the speaker. Hi, thank you, that was a very good talk. My name's Carol, I'm with the University of Colorado. I was just curious, this is, like you mentioned, this is RNA transcript data. Is, what's your timeline for rolling out like ATAC-seq or SiteSeq or some of that spatial transcriptomics? On your last slide. We are in the middle of conversations and explorations to allow um, um, uh, spatial transcriptomics data right now. And so that's probably going to be our next uh, goal to uh, implement in the census. And then after that, uh, we're probably going to the epigenetics data. It was a hard choice between the two, and there's only so much we can do. And we ended up going for spatial data since we constantly hear from the community that that's the, 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 the one that has the most potential out there. Yeah. Other questions? So I have one. Uh, how many users do you have? And maybe if you have a sense of like how many institutions or labs also, and uh, like what time scale, like on, on a given month or something like that? Yeah, so currently we have uh, in the order of, so we launched this feature back in May, in the middle of May, so it's been only two months. And since then we've had in the order of 300 users weekly. Uh, so that's, um, you know, that's close to a thousand monthly or over a thousand monthly, so it's pretty good. And we are trying to stay in touch with uh, a few 
labs who specialize on, on single cell analysis to stay tuned to the research that, that uh, they're doing and they're just been amazed with uh, the data availability and, and they're in the middle of, uh, of doing research specifically with all of this data. So we have a group of in the order of like uh, 15 researchers that we're keeping track uh, of what they're doing with their data. So you mentioned that you're gonna you're thinking about adding other layers to the to the end data. Is it currently the case that you are starting the raw counts? And for the statistics that you mentioned, are there any plans to also combine the package with um, scalable functions that will allow to do kind of like computation on the sparse matrix for the entire census? Um, yes and yes. So the first part, we are. Uh, planning to include other layers. Uh, we're probably gonna start small and include just a basic uh, normalized layer by sequencing depth. Um, and then we're gonna start thinking about what other layers we can include on top of that. Uh, for the pre-calculated stats, we're planning on a bunch, on a bunch of them, a number of non zero values, the mean, the variance, uh, and I don't remember which other ones, but a few other ones. And uh, not only we want to have those available for the user, but as you said, we're also trying to implement algorithms that work uh, not only in sparse matrices, but also work incrementally so that you can get chunks of the sparse matrix and then incrementally perform this, uh, this operation. So we already have a proof of concept for highly variable genes. You can uh, identify uh, highly variable genes across all the cells in the census in 20 minutes or so using these incremental algorithms. And uh, yeah, we're planning to do more on that area, a few other algorithms. So uh, probably focusing on these ones that I'm mentioning here. Yeah. The sort of sense making and uh, correlation analysis between uh, cells or cell groups as Angela was presenting yesterday, uh, could be greatly helped by putting that sort of data into a, a vector database. Has this uh, been put on a table as, the, as an idea? A table? Uh, so to speak. Has, has, ah, have there been plan about uh, putting the rows of that sparse matrix that uh, Angela is talking about into a vector database for uh, uh, analyzing using nearest neighbor graphs and so on at scale? Um, we haven't really thought too much about moving the data elsewhere to, uh, to perform that. I think if there is a clear opportunity for us to do that, we'll probably jump on that. So if you have any ideas on that, I'd love to hear afterwards. Um, what we are planning to do is uh, what I was just talking about, that we want to provide proof of concept and functionality to uh, let our users understand how you can perform these operations on a sparse matrix and a sparse matrix of this scale, uh, because that's probably where we wanna head towards, uh, especially in, in a space where RAM and memory is, is, is such a limitation when you, you're talking about this scale. Uh, but, but if you have any ideas, I would love to hear them. <laughs> We probably have time for about one more question before we uh, end for a break. Okay. Uh, well, seeing no more questions, uh, let's all thank our speaker, Pablo.